Hi everybody, welcome back. This is our second meeting for our summer workshop. Um, and first thing I wanted to do, we're gonna to talk today a little bit about thumbnailing. And the reason why last weekend, last week we talked about gridding, which was sort of trying to get you guys to think about everything as grids and that there's actually five planes inside your environment. You guys remember that? We talked about one, two, three, four, and five. So we have the sides is one, two, the top and the bottom, three, four, and the very back plane would be five, okay? And what I did is I did a couple of demos. I have that other lecture I can hand it out to you today. I just didn't want to put it on Facebook because then the world gets to see it, but if you want it, I can do it that way. Um, so one of the things that's really important about before we jump into the more advanced stuff, which is shapes and brushes and all this cool stuff, is my experience of being a teacher, my, ex my experience of working in the industry for 16 years, and then my experience of working in the industry and training other artists that were coming in. The one common thread that I always saw is everybody wants to skip over a lot of the prime steps, and they want to get to the good stuff, which is light and shadow and shape and like these huge epic pieces. But a lot of the times, the most common problems that I see always come back to the very beginning of thumbnailing. Nobody wants to do all the design work and the thinking that takes place in thumbnailing. In fact, I like to think of thumbnailing in my portfolio, I call it thinking and thumbnails. Okay, because thinking, here's the secret, is that I want to work small, so I think small, but uh, and I work small, and then I deliver big. It's never the other way around. You don't want to work big because that's going to eat up all your time and you're going to lose all your ideas. Okay, so um, one of the most important things to do is, is we start off here just to cover a couple of basics that we talked about last week. And then I'll show you samples from other students that I have and some other, you know, um, great um, compositions from thumbnails here. But the key thing to remember is that your little thumbnail can be linear based and eventually over time you can develop that into a tonal based thumbnail as you get better. If you're not at the point of working in full tone yet, that's just fine. You maybe don't have a good sense of lighting and mood. That could come a little bit later. Go back to the linear side, okay? Let's say you're doing one point and two point perspective thumbnails and then you feel like, okay, I'm doing really well, but I've nailed this, but I want to challenge myself to something else. Well, then try working in three point. Try doing something in a multiple pan shot, okay? There's all different directions that you can sort of go into. Um, so first off, let's talk a little bit about what exactly is thumbnailing, okay? Um, part of the history of that is a term used by graphic designers and photographers for a small image representation of a large image. Usually it, it comes from what we call the pre-production phase of doing something. So if you're going to put a magazine cover of a model on top of Vogue, you didn't just go out and take one picture, you'd go out and you'd do a whole series of thumbnail photos. And then you would pick maybe the four or five photos that came from a particular lighting scenario or dress scenario. Then they would take those and then they would go back, re-examine, do one more shoot usually based off of those. So the same thing comes back into the history of animation and game design and any other type of environment design, okay? There's more work usually put into the very beginning and what we call the pre-production side of that. And that's really important to know because when I have students that go interview with a company and somebody sits there and they go, what's your experience with pre-production and production? Well, you have a direct answer for them. You're not going to sit there and freeze up and say, well, I'm just a student. I don't know. You can sit there and go, well, I've been trained by a couple of my instructors uh, when we work from the pre-production level of designing which means working from thumbnails, gathering reference, developing our ideas, going to a rough, doing a line cleanup, going to a tonal study, and then going to a finish study. That's the difference between somebody who knows what they're doing and somebody that doesn't know what they're doing. Okay. Um, again, anything quite small or brief uh, is a drawing okay, or essay. That was another description. It doesn't have to be a super finished drawing. It could be really rough. That's totally fine. Okay. Um, I have a student who's not here today. Kelsey, I'm not going to say her name, um, a couple other students, right, that over time have this habit of skipping the thumbnail phase and they go to the larger drawing phase. Why would anybody want to go to a larger drawing immediately? Because they want to get to the detail. They want to get to the, the nitty gritty and the tone and all the fun part of it. The problem is, is that for the majority of you, you're bypassing or you haven't figured out compositional problems, you have tangencies, you don't have good overlap, you don't have a good directional path inside your environment, or maybe your focal point is distorted. One of those things apply there, okay? So 
after looking at all these different descriptions, I sort of came down to Phil's definition, which is a series of small drawings that help solve problems in design story and compositional arrangement. Okay, I thumbnail for different reasons. I thumbnail for shape and silhouette, which is a totally different approach. I thumbnail for environments. I've worked on sequences where I get hired to design an environment that's going to take place for a particular sequence, meaning there's going to be multiple shots or action uh, or camera movement happening in a period of frames, what we call a sequence. When I design an environment or location for that sequence, I have to be completely aware of what the script is calling for, the time period, how the camera's moving. Is it a long sequence? Is it going to be a, a one minute shot? Is it a 30, se 30 second sequence? Is there lots of cuts in between? I have to talk usually with a storyboard artist to figure out are we looking at, at you know top views, bottom views, reverse views? What are all the different locations that they're envisioning? Okay, because that's part of my definition. So when I, uh, part of my, not definition, part of my problem solving for pre production. Okay, so remember, pre production. Technically, in the industry, that's before we go into live production when you have immediate deadlines. So you're having to come up and you're having to think about what the characters' environments look like. Um, there's, let's say there's a chase sequence that's going to take place. Okay, This is a really common one, a great thing that benefits artists who come from a, a 2D drawing background and illustration that also can work in 3D. You're going to work on a chase sequence. Okay, It's going to be involved in a part of town like L.A. The chase sequence is going to last four minutes, but here's the problem: it's going to you're designing in 2D, but the show is going to be done in 3D. How do you create and reuse city environments and city buildings and streets to give you five minutes of chase, but by only building, let's say, one block or a block and a half of buildings? Does that make sense? Sort of like a, a core learning math problem that kids have. In elementary school okay so how would you do that you have to pull that off by thinking about uh, maybe making some like warehouses maybe making some buildings that are tall and fat some that are short and skinny and then by coloring them different textures and then you have to design out those buildings and you have to think about placing them in in different directions so when you're setting up your camera or your thumbnails at different point of views okay it's establishing uh, a different storytelling view to the uh, to the audience. Does that make sense? Okay, that's a typical problem you might have. Back in the day, I had an interview up at Pixar. When I was up there, they showed me all their finished, they had a room with all their finished production work from the first Nemo. And the position they had there was called a sketch artist. And one of the things they told me that a sketch artist was responsible for was drawing and sketching up solutions to 3D problems. And they said directly, that's part of the thumbnail phase. Well, what are 3D problems? And I remember looking at him. I already knew what it was. And I, say, and I said to him, and he said, well, for example, how do you create a whole school of fish in the background by using only the modeled fish that we have? Or are those fish modeled too heavily? And how do we have lower res models in the back? Does that make sense? So there's a whole position at Pixar that deals with just this problem solving area. So again, jumping to the finished art and all that glory and concept, that's not always the most important thing for artists. Part of an importance that you bring to the table is your ability to problem solve and to come up with solutions okay, for, for your design process. Okay? The intended goal is to aid the artist with options and solutions for a particular design problem with a series of rough sketches which are incredibly short in production time as compared to a finished piece. You know what I just realized? As I'm recording this, it's going to show you my screen that has four versions of it. But that's okay. I just realized I'm doing an on-screen recording. The mind screen is going to look different from what you're seeing up there. Okay, one-point perspective problems, okay? Most common problem that everybody leaves out. Frame, horizon line, not understanding where the cone of vision is and where the distortion's happening. Not understanding about frame rearrangement. Those of you that had me environment sketch, and we talked about that all that time over the whole semester. Rearranging your frame, making a better composition. Okay, uh, that's supposed to be grid, not gris. Grid plane arrangement. Okay, arranging your grids. D is right next to the S key, so now I feel better. Okay, <laughs> I just typed too fast, right? Um, grid plane arrangements. We talked about that last week. And then most importantly, establishing good, solid foreground, midground, background. Okay? Extremely important. 
See, this is driving me nuts now because now I can't. Oh, there it goes. Oh, see, that's what my screen shows. So I'm wondering if I should switch it so that way you get the recording. Does it matter? I guess it doesn't. Here, I'll go ahead and go to the next one. Okay, one point, two point, three point perspective solutions. Okay, we talked about these already. Horizon line, perspective indications. What gives, what indicates perspective? We talked a little bit about that last week. Scale. So that's huge. Anytime you go into a piece, remember I was sketching last week in the demo, and I indicated that if I didn't have scale, I had that castle in the back, and if I put a guy on the horse in the foreground, and he was super large and made the castle look totally diminished. Now, if I made him small, made the castle look super big. Scale is so important, but doesn't it sound really easy? Scale is the number one most uncommonly or wrongly used item by artists inside their work that doesn't help indicate size and mass and, and perspective definition. Okay, I see problems all the time. Okay, as we move forward, when we get into design. Now, this is hard. Some of you are drawing, you're doing grid planes, you're having to do thumbnails, come up with problem solving, right? But when we get into good designing, good designing is something that takes place over years, okay? So all this other stuff up, up above with perspective, one point, two point framing, horizon line, that's all basically the rules of draftsmanship, okay? All this stuff down here doesn't come over a semester. This comes from drawing in your sketchbook. It comes from looking at other artists. It comes from mimicking their work and copying their work, coming up with your own ideas and problem solving so, you know, solutions. This is something that you can't just develop in a semester. There's no way. My, my drawings, my paintings, they continuously, they always get better as long as I'm painting and working on something. Because I do one piece, and guess what? I do another piece. I might fail at the next one. That's fine. Then the next one after that is stronger. And you keep moving on. So here's where all this transfers into the whole sketchbook notation, right? If you are drawing in a sketchbook on a regular basis, not only are you designing and working in different subject matters, but you are forcing your brain to have to understand and look at composition and understand overlap, grouping, silhouette, and focal point. This right here, folks, these four right here are what separate you in this room from being a professional. Okay, because these four elements here are something that are learned over time. And there are some of you in here that have, remember, this category from here to here, that's all draftsmanship. Some of you have that. You can design. I mean, excuse me, you could draw really fast. You, you understand one point, two point. You can figure that out. However, though, when you get down into this other category here, this is where you need to write these things down, put them above your little art desk, okay, at home. And when you go look at other artists that you like, and you want to emulate their work and look at how they produce their work, ask yourself these questions. What are they doing for overlap? How are they grouping elements together? How are they using silhouettes in their visual reads? And where are their focal points? What also is focal point, folks? We talked about this environment sketching. Focal point is equal to brightness and contrast. contrast. That's right. Your focal point will be dictated by the biggest area of visual contrast that you have. You can have visual contrast in lighting, correct? You can also have visual contrast in what? Silhouette. Silhouette, right? Shape. Okay. So if I had if I have Simeon standing and Larry standing and Jameson standing and ever let's and Trevor standing. They all have black shirts on, but if Christine's standing in the middle, she has a white shirt on, where are you going to look at Christine every time? Because she's that establishes the contrast. So you establish contrast through shape, through tone. Does that make sense? Yeah. And through, the, here's the biggie, but you do this later when you're a little bit more advanced, this color is huge too. Because that was just black and white, why I gave that example. But the way I learned it back in the day, when we used to, I know it sounds stupid, I used to have to paint ice cream cones with different colors. Mm -hmm. Okay? And the benefit was doing that was thinking about what the highlight on that ice cream cone was going to be. Because it was dictated by the light. So if I had ice cream that was mint and it was green, and if I had a warm light, what happened to the highlight on the side there? If I put the highlight on the cone, the eye would go to the cone if the cone was uh, color similar to the green. Does that make sense? 
right? So if I have an opposite, if I have a contrasting color, but what happens if I have an alien? What happens if I have sherbet that's warm, and then I have a warm light at the end? It doesn't look as interesting, okay? Because you have two analogous colors that are helping each other. You don't have opposites hitting each other. So part of that opposite of focal point goes down to a couple areas. It's not just brightness and contrast. That's part of it, but it's also shape. Because good shape design, where you have, let's say, everything inside the piece. We'll look at a couple artists that are really good with this stuff, and I'll purposely make shapes look a little different than the surrounding environments to get your eye to direct to that particular point. Okay, where to start? We already talked about linear thumbnails and silhouettes. Lots of them. Then, linear thumbnails with tonal mass and light. Even more drawings. After that, we develop forward. We go to shape with light studies. And then we do more of those. Okay, how many people that were in the environment sketching class saw their drawings go from a linear phase, and when you put it into tone, what happened to it? It would change it, right? Jensen, wouldn't you say that? You guys? Mm -hmm. I mean, Jameson, Daniel. I'm sorry, I'm zoning out. You say you weren't looking at me. I know, I was looking, I'm mixing your, your guys' names up. Uh, and I didn't mean to do that, my brain's just a little... Uh, but I remember Daniel on a couple of your sketches, right? They drastically change depending on the direction of the light source, right? Yes. So that's when we get into the tonal mass and everything alters. Okay, silhouettes. Starting with good solid silhouette studies. Thinking about what we're going to design before we just jump in and draw it. If you're going to do a futurist, futuristic city, think about what your buildings look like. Map them out. And you guys know what I, I tell in my classes. One page is usually not enough. That's just the very beginning, okay? Take those silhouette shapes, incorporate them into different perspective views, okay? There's something you're gonna see. David was one of my, you know, it's funny, this guy lives all the way in Israel. And he was taking one of my online classes and he busted his butt. I think he's doing pretty good. I think he's still, he's working and has a lot to do with the industry. Um, but you see the frame here, you see the horizon line, you see a grid plane, you see overlap of shape, Okay, and then going on the design side, you're going to see variation of shape. Okay, you're going to see tall buildings, small buildings, wide buildings, angled buildings. Okay. This was another student, Ivan Joanovich. Really, really talented kid. Um, what was really cool is he could come up with ideas like this, and he had a beautiful drawing style. But he did the same sort of premise, okay? All of these guys came in and they drew okay, but they really had, they didn't have any, any form or structure to use inside their environment sketching. And by the time they left, they were just knocking stuff out of the park. But you gotta follow a couple basic steps. Steps. Uh, this is Luis Felipe Kemmerich, another amazing guy, okay? I showed some of this environment sketching, put this up on the blog to show samples as well. Okay, so you can see the importance of going from this, where he's just thinking about what the building shapes are going to be and how he incorporates that into here. Okay, extremely important. And then lots of thumbnails. This is just, I didn't, this is one page of many. But they, they had one week to do work. We would meet. They would go do work, and then they would come back. I had students from all over the world. They'd send it to me. We'd put it up so everyone could see their work, and then I would critique it. Okay, that's how most online schools tend to work. Um, dude, lots, lots of great studies, you know. It's so cool to see how that transfers into that, and then how he ends up going with something different. And look at how that's tall and thin, very attractive shape, great building, and then look at that, short and squatty. You know, and then you get something in the middle. Oh, I'm sorry. I just realized that. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, it'll be on the recording. For it. <laughs> I'll suggest the drawing to the right, short and squatty, right? I just realized that you can't see it. Okay. So there's some more great sketches. Okay. This is Pat. Pat is working now. He's at um, Bento Box. And I believe he just left Bento Box and went over to Disney TV. No, excuse me, DreamWorks. He's over at DreamWorks, working on their TV animation. Um, really talented guy. And what's funny is that his work wasn't as strong in the beginning, like he, he had a lot of hurdles to overcome, 
but he worked hard and he overcame them pretty fast. Naveen. You know where this guy's at? I'll show you some of his stuff in a little bit. Most totally like psychedelic type of guy. He's a visual development artist at Sony Imageworks right now. And I'll show you some of his other stuff a little bit later. He had a hard time drawing because he doesn't work as, he works with mass and tone. I mean, he's an amazing, amazing colorist. Has some of the best sense of color that I've ever seen. Um, he had a hard time getting some of the drawings down, thinking about things into shape and translating them into a linear format. But anyway, part of our thumbnails, it's not a contest to make a pretty drawing. It's all about thinking what you're doing. Okay, bad drawings lead to good drawings. I have numerous students in my classes that always come back to me and they like scratch stuff out, they rip stuff out of their sketchbook. No, you're going to have bad days. That's just a given. That's how every artist I know works. Every artist, whether male or female, even has a little, I call it an art period. It's like this little art cycle where you have, where you, seriously, you get like bummed on yourself and then you're like, oh, I suck, man. And all these people coming out are better than me and I'm not good. And then that wears off. And then you get really into what you're doing, and then and then you work a little bit harder, and then you produce great work. And then all of a sudden you go through this period again. We're like, man, everything I did sucks, and it happens. It just does. It's it's common. I have friends of mine that have worked for numerous years in the industry, and they'll call me up and we'll we'll hash it out over the phone. Be like, I feel like I'm just a hack, I'm like I'm not a hack. But it's all about you know drawing and to keep working. All right, this is where you end up with good thumbnails, okay? Good thumbnails, this is one of our guest speakers that was here, can have him come back out. Again, he also heads up the program now at Cal State Northridge. Back in the day, he was my teacher, and then I worked with him at a couple different companies at Real Effects, and then uh, worked with him uh, at Sony on the Adam Sandler feature project that they did. So, uh, Robert, amazing artist. What's really cool is that some of these are only this big. That's it. They're real small. They're a little bit bigger than a thumbnail, but they're blowing up. This is where the practice of thumbnailing and doing linear designs and then getting into a little bit of lighting, this is where it takes you. Okay? When you can start knocking out comps like these, and you could do three or four of these in a day, you've just sealed the deal. You've created a one for yourself because you have the ability to visually develop story ideas and concepts for environments and you can hand them out quickly. And if you learn tone and light, there's enough in there for you to get by. Look, there's an indication of light coming this way. You see it? See the shadow in there? So you have indication of light. You have a light side, you have a dark side, you have a reflection. You better understand perspective that there's a horizon line right in the middle here. It's about right here and that from there up is the building's there, and that is the same reflection going downward. Okay? I know. <laughs> I, I keep forgetting. There is a dedicated horizon line right here. You see that? And if you measure the distance from there to there, that's how you figure out reflections based off of the horizon line. Robert knows that. Robert knows that because he's went to Art Center, and he was trained in perspective and understands how to draw. Okay? Um, What's one thing, when you look at every one of these samples right here, what's something immediate that you see? For um, the ground background? Exactly. What else were we going to say? I was going to say the range of like dark to light. It's a really good range. Absolutely. So those are two key things right there. Constant overlap, foreground, midground, and background. I can't begin to tell you how many times I've told that to students, and then I get work, and the freaking foreground is empty. Like, your foreground should never be empty, ever. There's always something that you can place in there. Why? It's going to really help establish depth. Larry touched on something right from the beginning. You see darker in the front, and you see lighter in the back, right? So you have this feel of atmospheric perspective happening. If atmospheric perspective is indicated correctly inside a piece, it's going to make it feel realistic. So items that are closer towards you or darker, as they recede, they get lighter. Mandatory rule. Never changes. Well, excuse me. It does change, depending on the direction of the light. But for what we're doing, for the most part, where it changes is when you have a particular light lit in a scene. Let's say, for example, pick an alleyway. 
Imagine it being nighttime. What happens if there's a light on right in front of you in the foreground? The objects next to you are going to be lighter. And then objects that recede will actually be a little bit darker because they're receding away from the light. However, when objects keep receding and you see a, a set of buildings further back in the very background, those will be lighter because the rules of atm atmospheric perspective come into play. And it's really simple. The rules are is that items closer to you are darker and they're richer. And as things recede, light is sort of bouncing around and creates this haziness and it makes things become lighter. Okay? All right. Tone and light. After practice, you'll start to introduce light options that will change the entire composition of your thumbnail. Okay? Some of you that had me in environment sketch, and we did this a little bit. We would just do four studies. I was trying to get you to see the linear change and adaption of what happens inside your piece. The more tonal thumbnails that you do, guess what, in lighting studies, guess what happens? You start to see it in your head, okay? When you're creating a piece, your little computer will click on, and you sort of go through a Rolodex of options. You'll think about, well, what happens if I have light coming from the left? Now maybe I'll have light come from the right. Oh, I know how light from the left will be better because it'll have more shadows and we, te we tend to read left to right, and you'll come up with a better solution that way every time. Okay? So getting to this point, because I get this, you know, comment from students. I've been, I draw my skeptic all the time. I'm so tired of drawing environments. Well, you've only been drawing linear environments. What happens when you start to introduce tone and you go into a tonal site and you start introducing light and mood? Okay? If you want to work in the industry, these are the people that you're going to be working with. Seth Ingstrom here. He works in the industry. He's an extremely talented artist. Okay, These are his thumbnails that he did for, uh, for DreamWorks. And I think this was for um, Prince of Egypt back in the day. These are thumbnail studies on production. So imagine walking up and giving these studies to a director and saying, what do you think? Which one do you like the most? Is that commute? Com commute. Look. Does that compute for most of you on the level that you need to try to get to from practicing and drawing? Some more thumbnails from Pat. Look at how rough those are. Super rough, right? But you can clean them up. Then you can go back in and you can put light on them and give them mood and feeling. And he changes the overall sensibilities of what you're looking at. Okay. Um, we're going to start to talk about this probably next week, when we, not next week, we skip next week, but when we come back the week after that, we're going to start talking a little bit more about building a tonal composition. Some of you, we haven't done this before because we've been working in an, a linear fashion. This is the great thing about how shapes come into play, okay? Because what you're working with here is you just start with the very basics of sketching with big, with different brushes, thinking about atmospheric perspective, but what you start to do is you start to develop shape, okay? When you look at this sketch right here, what is that? Which one? I'm sorry, I'm <laughs> using the mouse again. The upper left corner, my bad. That way I'm recording this so you guys get the full screen. The upper left one, this one right here. Looks like it could be an oil derrick or something. Could be oil derrick. Anyone else? What could that be? Some machine place. That's machine place? Like... I thought it could be a base. For a minute there, it looks like it could be a hangar or something there, a base. Then for a minute, it looked like it could be a spaceship or something, right? You see anything else? What it could be? It could be a docking area for spaceships. Okay, it's like five things there. We have no idea what that is. That's one of the great things about leaving a linear base drawing is that we can leave part of the drawing to what we call lost and found edges to be unknown. All we have to do is give enough information to the subject matter as to what is happening. And it's actually a really, really simple formula. It's really as simple as, as having a group or men or army or something that indicates scale, either in the foreground or midground or in the background, and then having a large shape of where they're going and then everything else is sort of supporting detail. 
It's literally that easy. Okay. What about the one below that the thumbnail there? Can you tell what type of building this is? Is that a police station? Is that... You go back to that view mode. And now you can see me point at it. You can't tell what these buildings are, can you? There's nothing specific. You just know that they're large building shapes. All they have to be are big, large mass reeds. And what distinguishes these guys pop out, so by having them in there, and then having something a little bit smaller in the back there, you automatically get a sense of scale. So you realize if that guy's that tall there, back here he's like a dot, and then look at the size of that building. Even looks like there's a couple ships or something in there floating around. Okay? We're going to get to that pretty soon. You don't have to... This is the cool thing about leaving the linear side to it. However, though, why is the linear side important? Is you have to be able to go back into your tonal studies like this, and you have to be able to say, oh, my perspective was off there. I know that because I spent numerous hours and semesters and years drawing linear thumbnails inside my sketchbook. I can figure out what, you know, what's happening on a perspective basis. What about this one right here? I don't know where that's at, right? I can't tell if I, those feel like some type of tall electrical pole or telephone pole, right? So there's an emotional feel you start to get off of thumbnails. I, when I look at that, I think of industry. I think of like buildings and factories and there's lots of like smog or fog or something in the air. It could be early morning. It could be vapor coming up from like a plant. I don't know what it is, but it looks pretty cool. There's a good mood to it. That's a cool thing about going into tone is that now you get to leave some of that linear side back and you get to focus on what is the feel and the mood, which is the emotional impact of the thumbnail. Okay. What about this top one up here? Does that look like a happy place? No? No. First of all, it's at an angle. It's at a massive angle going this way. Whenever things at ang or at angles, what does that convey? Are you guys sleeping right now? <laughs> when we see things at angles. I was watching Fury again last night. You know what Fury is? The Brad Pitt? The Tank movie? And every time there's like a battle scene, the camera does this. Everything's tilted, and they're like, hurry, go, load around, and everything's angled, and they're shooting, and they're blowing up tanks, and then when it's calm, everything's even, okay? This is a huge Dutch tilt on this thing right here, and it's a little hard to see, but there's a creature, or there's a beast right in here that looks pretty nasty, okay? That's, and then look at the spikes on there, the old, look at the, those look like grandma's old claws of evil sticking into the ground, okay? It's awesome. All right, let me switch here on, uh-oh. I'm gonna switch displays and go back so I have the large view here. There we go. Here's some more samples here. I'll, I'll get some of these images and I'll post them up when we get to this. This is our direction of where we're going. I have to go through this stuff for the first couple of weeks and then we wanna to get to this point right here. This is your guys' goal is to be able to knock out full-fledged environments like this quickly, in tone, with a feeling of light. Now, there are points where you get to cheat. Well, how do you get to cheat? In the environment class, we were very specific about the direction of light that was coming from, right? We knew if it was coming from the left, the right. I had you guys design with light arrows. When we go into tone, we get to cheat sometimes. We can do little things like we can come over here and this the bottom left one, we can put this sort of light flare on top of the guy. That might not make any sense because what direction is the light coming in at right now? It's coming from an angle from behind, right? But that artist needs to make a decision. His biggest area of contrast right now is where? It's up on the top there. So put a freaking light flare on the guy you want wants you to look at and that's going to make your eye jump to that guy okay 
I wish you could see here. I want to switch these again. Go back. How beautiful some of these pages are. Window, slideshow, play from current. Look at how beautiful this is. See how you can see the mountains in the back there just a little bit coming through. And see how the light goes over that silhouette shape. Look at look at how interesting the silhouette shape is right here. Okay. So we're talking about the upper left hand corner. Look at this, this building, the structure that's here. Look at how interesting that overall shape is. And then look at the dark against the light right there. And then the way that light sort of comes in and has a gradient go right across. Okay. That right there is a little tip. Anytime you have a gradient, the human eye and the mind love gradients. Gradients mean detail. If you have gradients in the right places, anytime you have gradients next to each other, the eye will go look at that immediately, and the eye will stay there and will not want to leave. Okay? All right. Let's go to the next one here. Okay. Look at that! I gotta switch this this place. Why oh, give me a switch? How do I go back? Is this how I switch? Nope. Okay, well I'm gonna leave it here. I'll just talk to you guys about it. Look at this one in the upper left hand corner right here. What kind of ship is that? Like a tank field. A what? I want to say a tank field. It looks like it has treads or something. Okay. Someone said tank related, right? The upper left-hand corner, right? I got that feeling of an aircraft carrier. But it lo looks a little different, right? Can you see where the captain's area is? Do you see planes on there? No. You don't see any of that. All you see right now is a core shape. You have an idea of where light's coming. You have some clouds in there, some light. This is how really cool compositions develop sometimes. It's just you getting in there messing around with some brushes, getting some dark and light, developing, and then you go out, and then you have to go back in there and start thinking about shape and where things are happening. Um, look over on the right hand side here. I don't know if you can see this progression. You see what that is? It's just basically a simple arrangement of shapes with a lasso tool. That's what I'm going to be showing you coming up in the next two weeks. We're going to be doing this. We're going to be sitting down using the lasso tool only the lasso tool for a little bit. And we're just gonna, we're gonna, I'm gonna teach you how to do a command fill option. Okay, not fill me, fill the color. <laughs> okay. And then that way you just hit command F and then you can fill it with whatever color you get. Command F and enter really quick. And then it fills it and turn it into a hotkey. Then you could go around and you start creating these compositions really fast. Sometimes when I create compositions at home, I don't know where I'm going with it. It develops into something really cool. There's something to be said about that. There's something to be said about creating compositions and developing something by what we call the happy accident. Okay? What well, is it? The happy accident. What happens when you flip a composition backwards? What happens if you flip it upside down? Inverse it. What happens if you flip it vertical and make yourself, force yourself to have to develop a composition out of it? That's where you start to get something really neat. You guys know who Scott Robertson is, right? Okay, really talented artist, made a lot of great books, used to run the Art Center program. Um, Scott has a great, I actually have it, has a DVD where he does these little thumbnails and markers. And then he zooms into them and then he rotates them at multiple angles. Because he's trying to come up with compositions that he wouldn't have thought of. Because when you, you sit in front of a piece of paper sometimes, it's really hard to come up with an idea. You sit there and... If you guys all have not experienced that, where you're trying to come up with a solution or an idea to something, and you just sit there and stare at a blank piece. So the whole idea was by having a marker comp with all these different darks and lights in it, you could flip it around, and you might see what looked like a giant battleship. You might see what looked like a little village of a house living in the background. You might see the silhouette of a mech, and then you could go in there and carve into that and paint out of it. Okay. This is what we're going to start to do is what we're looking at in the upper right hand corner right here. And then from this, this is just what we call a texture overlay. It's that simple. We, there's a couple different ways we create texture overlays. So you guys that went to my graduate show, you saw my whole wall of tone up there, right? This is how I did every single piece on my wall of tone. I just outlined the shape, 
And then sometimes when I had time, I would go back into it and I would put a texture pass on it. How do you paint rock really quick? Well, the easiest way to paint rock really quick is to just grab a piece of rock, turn it into a brush, and just stamp it right on top and you're done. Okay? Another way to paint it is to have a, a brush that's called a rock brush that you create yourself. And anytime you paint that on top of a darker image, the light will create contrast, being the lighter color on the top, the lighter gray, and then you get this feeling right here. You get this feeling of rock and texture and pattern. Okay. Some of you that don't understand this concept, we have to go back to this. So you see how it's a little, little bit of trickery on you guys where you have to learn perspective and drawing and gridding and planing 1 point, 2 point, 3 point. We haven't even touched into composition yet. And then we talked about, I mentioned after we do all that, then we get to design, right? Then you guys are having to think as designers. You're having to think about what does that building look like? What's the difference between an old house? So if you're working on a show and you have to draw an old 19, imagine a old 1900s house that an old lady lives in, okay? Well, is the lady good or bad? It's going to depend on how I draw the house. If she's bad, I might have big pointy gates. I might have lots of other dead trees and angular shapes around. What if she's a nice lady that happens to live in the old haunted house and it's not her fault? Maybe I have a bunch of round shapes around. I have round bushes. That's where we start getting into more composing. That actually ties into art direction. Okay, When you can look at a visual shape and get a read off of that shape with there being no detail and have an idea what the intended emotional impact is. Have you guys seen the trailer for Pets, by the way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How awesome do those characters look? Have you seen how great their shapes are in their designs? I just saw it on TV, and my wife paused it for a minute because one of my my daughter was about to punch my son in the face. Okay, <laughs> and she paused the TV, and I ignored everything that was happening. And I'm like, "Look at how cool that freaking dog is! And the shape was so like perfect." And I, if I'm right, it's uh, anyone know who did the designs for that? Mm. No, huh? Anyone? Okay, I'm looking forward. I didn't know who did all the designs. I have a, a couple ideas, and it's a couple of the key designers that have done work on some of the other past movies, but um, it could be somebody new and different. So composition, how do we get there? These are some of the basics. Um, this is a sheet you could go grab off of Google. It's free. You don't have to buy the $35 book to get it out. This is from Edgar Payne. Edgar Payne was an American illustrator who traveled around parts of the frontier, and he would go around and he would do a bunch of paintings showing what the frontier looked like uh, in the quote unquote Wild West days. And um, he came up with this, this book where he talked about basics for compositions. So if you struggle on composition and you can't quite get there, this was a really simple approach. And I could give this to you, it's really easy. You just go to Google, type in Edgar Payne's composition studies or outlines, and it'll just pop up right there, and then you could print this. There's a couple pages of them, but they're really cool. He breaks down basic theories of composition. Now, there's a pro and con to this page. This is a simple compositional idea for you to come up with composition, and it works. You can follow the steps in here, and it'll completely guide you through. What sucks about it is that none of these are set up for what we call emotional impact in composition, which is what storytelling is. Okay, so these will help you as a beginner, and if you get stuck on something, getting into the emotional impact is more about how to set up the scene and how to prep what's going to happen. So when you're looking at it from a lighting standpoint, you have a better idea of what's going to happen before it happens inside the image. Okay, there's a couple more of the studies there, and he labels them group mass, three spot, suspended steel yard. Diagonal line, which is one of my favorites. There's a couple of these that I, I like. I do S compound in almost every single composition that I have. I love S. Even if it's a diagonal, I still have part of an S in there somehow. I love organics. Okay, but what I'm thinking about a lot of times when I'm using these studies, okay, is how do I? What are opposites here? What's that? That's a 90, right? So how do I do a composition? where I involve a 90 angle, what's completely opposite from a 90 degree angle? 
circular or an S. So how do I do an L composition, a rectangular composition, and have a radiating line inside it or have a circular composition around it? That's where you get, now you've raised the notch. Now you're, you're creating contrast between multiple elements, having to think about um, what the outcome might be. It's pretty cool stuff. There was some of my studies that I had on my show. So these are just really basic light studies. Excuse me, thumbnail tonal studies with no light inside them yet. Um, maybe one or two have a little indication like this guy had just, I have a brush that does light rays and I just stamped it in the back and then I had light rays to make it look like it, there's a city behind it, okay? There's no light in this right now at all. Some of you saw the finished piece of that. This was based off of the cross composition from Edgar Payne. Edgar Payne has, he had, you know, gave one of his comments we're using crosses inside your composition. So I thought, well, that also ties into L composition. So I thought it would look pretty cool if it looked like a bunch of bases on these hills. But then I wanted to put something for focal point because I had no focal point for that. Some of you that went to my show, you saw I had a big moon here with like a spaceship right there. Okay, on the side. That was sort of the finish. This was another idea that I had where I had a bunch of shapes, buildings. I'm going to give you guys all these shapes. This is my shape library. It's all free. I'll give it to you and you can go in and start creating this. So this is usually step one. Remember how I said we use the lasso tool? We'll do that first for a couple for, for an assignment. And then after that, I'll give you the custom shapes. Then you can go in. The great thing about custom shapes is I don't have to do all this. See all that intricate stuff? All that detail there? That's my boat, by the way. It's my boat turned vertically. I put it in things all the time because it makes like a cool antenna or side building right there. There's part of it right there. So I'll show you how to make a couple of your own shapes and then you can start coming up with stuff like this pretty quickly. This little composition right here, is there enough to get a visual? I'm sorry, I realize I'm using the pointer again. This one right here in the, in the bottom right, there's enough information in there for you to get a gist of the story, right? There's two characters there, there's a mothership and they're at a, some type of a loading dock, right? That's all that I need to get. That took me about 20 minutes of time to map that out. It was just using shapes and overlapping them, putting them together, put scale, and that's it. The next phase to this would be light and texture. Have a direction of light coming in, come in, start putting texture, and then develop your piece further. Same thing with these, okay? There's, so what, what composition is the one in the middle right here? It says it below, guys. Come on. You can see right there. It says group mass. All right? That's group mass. This is diagonal line. Look at that huge diagonal on the right there, splitting through the composition, little ship. Okay? This one on the left is called three spot. When you have three primary spots inside a composition, which is very similar to what we call a triangular composition. Okay? The one on the left is radiating line. All the majority of the lines and these little hoses radiate into the city. The one in the upper right is an L-based composition. This is an L. There's an L here, L here. Do you see them with the shadows? It's pretty much all L-based. Okay, I just thought if I would flip them, I have some going this way and flip one going the other way. Okay. This was also sort of an L-based composition, the one on the lower right. Um, it's harder to see on the projector here, but it's recorded here. You can see it. See, there's an L in there. There's sort of an L here. There's a large L shape here. Okay, this is sort of cross, you know, like an L. Remember, cross and L are really similar to each other. Okay. Um, same thing with these. These are all just quick little studies. You hopefully you should be at the point by the end of this, I'd say by meeting seven, where you should be able to start knocking some of these out in about an hour to an hour and a half of time. Because it's just shape overlapping other shapes, going from dark to light, and then we come in at the very end and then we add in texture and we add in light. And then once you the beautiful part that starts to happen is when you start to put in a light like the mood just happens 
and it literally changes the piece where people will walk up and be like, you know, like this one right here on the bottom right uh, with the two robots there. That's called balanced scales, by the way. Two similar objects on both sides. Thought it looked like two robots like looking at each other. All that was done with a brush. I have a tree brush. <laughs> Took like two minutes to create all this stuff in the middle. I have a cloud brush. That's it. Composition's done. Okay. All right, some more. I love doing these little studies because there's so much you could come up with. And some of them might not be that successful, like this one over here on the left, Steel Yard, one on the bottom left there with the large ship, this guy. This one wasn't too successful. I was doing the Steel Yard, which is a large element and a small element. But it, what I did like about it is a friend of mine saw it and made a comment that it looks like that ship's leaving. Like it's departing, and I sort of, ooh, I sort of like that. Maybe by having the ship on the left instead of the right, left reminds people of like exiting off stage and leaving. Maybe that'll give that a little bit of a different feel. Um, anyway, let's keep going here. Okay, so these were some of the 60-minute studies that I started getting into. I had these in my show. Okay, so a lot of these are brushes and just simple shapes. I get one old tree, and then from one old tree... I can make five other trees. Some of you in here work in Maya, right? That's a great thing about working in 3D. I can take one model, tweak it, bend it, duplicate that, tweak and bend that one, then do it again. Next thing you know, i got five different trees. Well, guess what? I can do the same thing in Photoshop very easily. I can stamp down one brush that's just a flat silhouette. I can go back onto that. I could add vines. I could add leaves. I could add dead. I could copy and paste part of it on top of itself. And then put it back together and I could scale it and bend it a little bit and then select that and then create that as a brush. Now I have a second tree brush. Next thing you know, I do five more minutes of that. I got three different tree brushes. I overlap them together and boom, you have the ability to start knocking out compositions really quickly. Okay, so what we'll do when we get to this, this will probably be maybe about, not next week because we still need to talk about shape and then I need to show you how to create shapes. We'll talk about it using the lasso tool and stuff, but probably about meeting five, we'll be sitting down doing this. Okay, I'm going to give you guys a subject matter. Like I might say, kids going to school, and then you need to come up with a composition for it. But you have the freedom to do that. Okay. I have a oops, whole bunch of castles for you guys. I didn't realize I could have showed it this way. Which, let me hold on and see what happened there. Okay. And that was our last image here. This is one I really liked. I really enjoyed this one. Um, I was just sort of goofing around one night, and I had this idea of a castle in the back. And then I like the. I always love the idea of, like, these large gateways when you enter a castle because you're entering something important. Um, and then I just, I had this, again, there's that S curve. You see the S winding through here? And I kept thinking about putting different people, and I thought, hey, what if I have I have shapes of horses? And I put a couple horses in there, put a couple guys. I went on, I draw on the guys. I was looking at Mongolian warriors. So I was thinking this was up in the hills of like, you know, India, Nepal. They'd have like these weird hats and different types of spears, and maybe they're. And then I thought, well, what are they doing? And then I thought, oh, maybe they're escorting somebody. So I put found a carriage shape online. I went to Google and typed in carriage, and I found a carriage, and then I just deleted the white behind it, and just took it and identified it as a shape and stamped it in there. That's simple. That easy. But once I did it once, I got it forever, and then I have the brush, which is cool. Okay? All right. So hold on. There's some other stuff I want to show you really quick. So... Part of what I was doing... What I would like some of you guys to do if you're not doing this already. I know last week I sort of threw things at some of you and some people might have looked a little confused. Okay, But um, those of you that have had me are, are doing exactly what you're supposed to do. Here's a piece by Rob Rupel. I'd like to get Rob here as a guest speaker. He's really amazing. One part of Rob's background, just to tell you, is that Rob was uh, an animation artist back in the day. I actually worked with a guy that worked with him. And, and then Rob ended up leaving uh, Disney 
and uh, features, and he got involved in painting, and he got a job at Naughty Dog, which is in Santa Monica, which is a game company. And he started working as like a conceptual artist for that. And he started basically developing all their you know, ideas and paints. So R Rob also has a really great book on, book that's out there. Uh, have you guys seen it by chance? It's, it's really, does anyone know the name of it? I forget what it's called. Graphic LA. Gra yeah, I thought it was graphic something, yeah. Gra I thought it was graphic, that was graphic LA. And he basically goes around and does all these little great studies, which is really funny. You know who else has an awesome book out there? I posted it on Facebook. If you want to go donate for it right now, uh, it's called Vignettes by Armand Serrano. You can pledge, like I think it's like 55 bucks, and you get a signed copy of the book and a print. 35 for just the book, but if you do 55, he has another book coming out with some extra pages, or I mean, extra pages in the book with a signed print. I just did 55, because I like supporting fellow artists. So it's pretty cool, and, then you, and the book will be like gone, which is, you know. and But it look, absolutely looks amazing, and he's doing the same type of stuff. He's going out, doing lots of little studies. I've been, I used to blog with Armand back in the day, and one of the things that he was doing when the iPad first came out, and a couple of the really base programs came out for painting in the iPad. He was just going around making selections of like paints and just putting color on top of other color. That's it. Not even getting into a lot of detail, just overlapping shapes on top of them and getting the colors to map out. Okay. Um, so I'm going to put up, you can select any artist that you want. I just grabbed a couple artists here that I like to look at because I like their work and I like the way they use lighting. So look at Rob here. Okay. You want to be able to take a piece from somebody. And this is the method of thought you need to get to. If your perspective ability is limited, you need to be able to think of everything being wrapped inside a piece. Imagine if you had a whole bunch of yarn or rubber bands. You have to be able to take that yarn and those rubber bands, and you have to be able to overlap it on everything. Okay? If you start to do this, you're going to develop a really simple approach to understanding how shape works. When you have a basic shape, basic shape turns to form. Okay, how does it turn to form? It turns to form by two different ways. It turns to form by texture and by light. Okay, so what does that mean by texture? Okay, if I have this long hill right here that's going down, okay, that's going to turn by having the texture of the bushes on it or the rocks or the little the, the dirt clods or whatever. When that happens, we have something, we have, this is sort of Phil's term, I have what I call a major and a minor axis, okay? So think about in perspective when you're dealing with an ellipse, it's the same thing when you're dealing with shapes. I have two different line directions and how that shape is going to be dictated. And that's going to dictate whether the shape is flowing against something, whether it has a concave surface, whether it's convex surface, does that make sense? Okay, the way that I dictate the lines on my grids, and the, one of the best things you can do for this is to sit down and grid. When you get tired of gridding and drawing all these grids, you get bored of drawing flat grids, you need to start drawing. I'm doing this with my hands, right? You can't see it in here, but I'm doing this. I'm making these crooked concave. Concave is like a skateboard. It curves in. Convex is where it curves out and over. So if you can go into your drawing, and if you can start on your thumbnail, Thinking like this, this is what separates the people that know draftsmanship and know how to draw from the people that don't. Okay, Scott Robertson, does he know draftsmanship? Yes, he can draw. Okay, Feng Zhu, does he know how to draw? Yes, he does. I have an old video of his from Noman when like he used to still paint under the line. And he didn't break away from painting under the line, which is a whole other battle that some of you are going through. Okay, we're not getting into the shape yet. I'm trying to do that in this workshop for you guys to show you guys. Now Feng's totally beyond that. That was many moons ago. He's an amazing painter. He has great demos on his website, and he's really fantastic to look at. Same thing with Rob. Rob was a great draftsmanship. He was a layout artist. He used to draw environments. That's one of the great things about the majority of all the artists I know that are visual development or concept, concept artists now. Guess where they came from? They're layout artists. They're background designers. They spent years mastering and understanding draftsmanship, okay? This is what you want to be able to get to is this. If you can sketch and do thumbnails like this, you've succeeded. So 
Think of major and minor axes. We don't want to have lines all crisscrossed all over thing, all over everything and make it look sort of rough and not correct. You have to be able to indicate a major line if it's receding or going away from you. That's going to indicate surface planes. So I'm going to pick up this little piece of paper here. As I look at this composition, here's another painting here by Rob Ruppel, right? First off, where's the horizon line in this piece? Yeah, it might be about, I'm using the paper here on my screen. I'll point up here. It might be about right here. Okay. Sorry, it blends in there. I get the blue ruler. So it might be about right there. But it also might even be higher. It might even be outside of the picture. We're looking down on this location, okay? Some of you that started gritting and sketching last week upstairs, I was looking around and everybody had this. Flat grid, flat grid, flat grid, and everything was all flat. Why not do this? And create a round, create a hill. So look at his composition here. Look at this. Can you feel that curving? And wrapping off to the end, it drops. Okay. Can you get this feel? Ah. Okay. You have to be able to translate that into that. You have to be able to look at part of your image and go on top of it and be able to think about things and how they exist in grid. By doing this, you're automatically establishing foreground, midground, backgrounds. And you also remember we talked about last week, we have those five areas, right? The five planes, like when we're looking in the room. We have left and right, top and bottom, and the back. There's five different areas for us to draw. Okay? So, how do I know that this mountain right here, and this is an important part because when we get into painting and you start addressing that there's a facade change. Do you see this? On this mountain right here, there's a facade change from here to here. You see that happening? Okay? How do you indicate that in paint? Well, in order to indicate it in paint, you have to understand what's happening in a linear fashion. You have to understand that there's a major and minor axes happening there. So what's the major and minor axes here? The major axis is a line coming this way. Do you see it with the detail? It's there. Do you see it? It's right there. Okay. And if we come back and look at sort of a 90, you can almost see like a little bit of a line here. And then imagine that line wrapping around. You see that? Okay, the line's not there like a freaking bold line for you to see it. It's the fact that you know it. So when you're painting, you give these little indication clues of facade changes, of things wrapping around corners, of rocks having a front side, a top side, and maybe a back side. By doing that, okay, and understanding that right there, that's what's really important. This brings me back to... Uh, something I was going to show last week and I didn't because I thought it would be so basic. It brings me back to seventh grade. When I was in seventh grade, I had a wonderful art teacher, Bernardi Gorba Jr. High. His name was Mr. Graver. And guess what, Mr. Graver? How would you teach a bunch of seventh graders perspective? You can't. So it's really hard, okay? So what he did is he taught us how to understand melted pancakes. Okay, which was like, if you ever go to the beach and take a handful of wet sand and you hold it and it like drips on itself and you make like this cool looking castle, then you do like four more of them, then you create a little world, and then you make the wall and everything. It was sort of like the same principle. He taught us how to draw a horizon line, and everything we learned about from that point on was about understanding grids and plans. And then he would come in and he would do this thing where he would cut out like a pancake and then you would draw that down going into a set of cliffs. And you would just keep adding to the piece. I'll do a demo for you in a minute. Okay? But that's how you got to that. Okay? This just doesn't develop out of the error from osmosis. Okay? It's understanding how to wrap shape with rubber bands and not just how to use grids, but how do you turn shapes to make them go downhill or uphill or have shapes wrap corners. That's what you really need to know. You have to understand how to show the audience that that is a top surface and then it drops down and comes down here. And if you look at 
my overpass that I did on there, it makes sense. I'm just going off of the line. The first thing I'm doing is I'm looking for the major and the minor axis. So if you could, now there you're like, oh my God, it's too much white. It, there is, it takes over, okay? But see, that's what happens when you work into tone is you sort of get this happy medium between both. This is where all the, the time and the semesters are doing thumbnails comes to meet its partner, linear thumbnails, comes to meet the next evolution, which is the tonal. Okay, this is where they come together, okay? Same thing in here. Really basic. This is, so that was Rob Rubel we looked at. Here's a, an image here from Sparth. I love Sparth, okay? What I like about Sparth is he's just really simple storytelling, really simple graphic use of shape, and really simple laid-back lighting. That's it. He doesn't have to get any complex. He doesn't get caught up in detail. He stays simple. And he's really great with understanding compositional arrangements of shape. Okay? That right there, does that look pretty cool to you? Would you like to have that in your portfolio? Would it not make you feel good to think like, hey, I created that. If you had created that, I don't know about you, but that would be a booster of confidence. I'd be like... Dude, I freaking made this awesome piece with a guy crossing a snow landscape going to somewhere else. And, you know, and so when you break that down, it's actually pretty simple. It's just a, a base grid plane. Look, the, the freaking trees are just cones. Just draw a cone. You know where the horizon line is? The horizon line on this piece. I can't see on top of that roof all the way. Right? I, I can see on top of this. I can't see on top of this. I can't see on top of this. Oh, wouldn't you know? That line's almost about horizontal right there. His horizon line is somewhere about like right here in that piece. Right in the middle right there. I can't see on top of this, but he has it angled a little bit. Okay? And what's really cool, we're talking about shape and silhouette. What's one of the most interesting sil silhouette shapes in there? Anyone? The big, uh, top thing right there. Yeah. See how that stands out? It's a little bit bigger than the guy. Without that there, I wish I could I should go into a piece and take that out. Without that there, you're like, well, where is he going? <laughs> right? That's a really important little piece right there. Because you see a little bit of the castle, but the castle is blocked by this big object right here, right? It's blocked by the big rock. It's a little hard to see. But by putting that up there, as soon as I saw that, I'm like, ooh, I know exactly where that guy's going. He's going to that little city over there that's got that cool little thing up on the top. It looks like somebody could stand through there and look out. That's all he did is he had to put something really interesting over here to make this the focal point. And then... In terms of composition, look at where this leads. See that line that comes straight down? Boom. And it hits right here. Gee, this line comes right here to this little house. The trees point you right to that house. Look, even the curves in the snow point you right into there. Look at this. Three shapes. I don't know what they are, but they're getting smaller as they recede. And where do they take me to? Right here. Come up here, look at the mountains. Where do the mountains go? This pushes me down to here. This comes down off this edge, it curves, and it comes, see this line? It comes right off there and brings me right back in there. He wants you to look at that little house right there. And he's gonna take you to that house, and then he's gonna move you around. He's gonna take you to here. Shadow, nice area of contrast, and he's gonna move you to here and move you back to here. And does that very well. That's why he's such a genius with what he does, okay? That is just that right there. Everyone in this room should be able to do that. If you're doing environments that don't feel like they have a lot of space, they don't feel like they have a lot of depth, one of the reasons it's most common with students is they're picking subject matter that's too complicated. I wanted to do an illustration with 10 gnomes running to the magical unicorn and they all have potions and shields. It's too complicated. Just Give us a large desert with a, a dude on a horse. Walk in to simplify the whole thing. Okay, just go nice and you simplify it. Okay. If you can map that out really quick as like a rough line drawing and then go into that with tone, 
you're going to be 20 times more successful because not only have you determined the linear basis of all the perspective and the feel of the of the surfaces, but you know, it, it, but it, it gives you that feel of what's happening and where it's going, and then you get to go in there with light and have fun with it, and then that's the fun part is sitting down. It's the part I love about teaching: sitting down one on one with somebody and going, where do we want to put the highlights? Where do you want the eyes to look? Where do you want the secondary? What about the tertiary highlights? Where do you want the third read to be? What do you first notice? What do you not notice? That's the great stuff is when you get to that point and you get to talk about all that cool stuff. Okay? There's another one. I'm telling you, Sparth has this way of just, he just keeps everything simple. And you know what? I got to tell you, from my own background, I even battle that a lot because I'm so used to, like, keeping things complicated. It's the way I was taught in animation. You know, maybe it's from being a background designer for all these years, like working on shows like Batman and, you know, like Joker has a den, you know, with chemicals and it's a warehouse and this. It's like everything's always overcomplicated and tons of stuff in there. When part of the answer sometimes is just simplification. To simplify it, stay easy. I mean, look at this. Same thing. So what do you notice in this piece here? Guy in the front crossing a lot of area to get to something in the back. Right? That's simple. And then a little bit of airy composition around there to let you know where you are. And what do we have here? People in the front. <laughs> distance across to something important. It's a little bit airy to let you know where you are. Surrounded by mountains or whatever. Just really simple. And then the one thing the Sparth does he's a total genius at is his shape arrangement and the size of those shapes. Opposites. Which is a one of the primary... Uh, my opinion, one of the most important things with composition in general, the rules of composition, opposites, okay? And um, he always plays small against large, always. If you have something large, he's going to have something tiny or small in it. That's just a golden rule in general. You can't break away from that. If you have somebody tiny, you better have a giant-ass rock right next to them. Because it's going to make that tiny person stand out. It will. It's that simple. If you have a giant, super giant structure in the back, you better have smaller mountains around it and small little dragons or birds or whatever. Okay? That is just a couple grids. There's nothing fancy in there. That is not that hard to draw. Everybody in here, as far as I'm concerned, after basic drawing, should be able to draw that right there. If you have the right basic drawing class. And that's why I wrote a class here for basic drawing for entertainment arts. Michael taught it, but now I'm, I'm going to take it over and I'm going to be teaching it every semester. And this is why. Because most people aren't taught this anymore. I get kids in my class all the time that don't know the difference or they don't know how to apply one point and two point. They sit in the freaking hallway and they draw a one point drawing of a hallway. How boring is that? You know? I don't want to... Can you imagine putting someone in the hallway and go, draw this hallway now! On 18 by 24 paper. It's like huge. And they're like drawing this hallway. And they're like, I had never done perspective. And they're drawing this huge. I mean, how intimidating is that? You ever heard of a thumbnail? Yeah. <laughs> see the hallway doing it every year. Oh too. my God, I see that. And I'm just like, I walk by petrified. And I hand out my business card and go, here. When you want to come <laughs> take a bite perspective, come take the class with me. We're not going to do a hallway drawing. Oh my God. A hallway drawing. Don't even get me started. Okay. That right there. Simple, easy. That doesn't look like anything in a sketchbook, but I'm telling you, if you could knock these out one after another, some of you might think like, oh, I already know my, I already have good draftsmanship. I know this. I know that. Uh -uh, you're wrong. Because it, it, the more of these you do, the better you get, the better you understand depth, and the better you understand how to do this. Rotate planes in your head. Be able to draw something and rotate it from another angle. How do you draw a cliff and show that cliff coming down in an angle, then popping back up and going the opposite way around and curving? That's how you get to a point where you start to draw shapes that are bending and contorting and that are concaved and convex. That makes your work feel realistic. Okay? So I put that up for you guys, those samples right there. I want you to go back and look. And then I threw up, I had a couple others. I just, well, already had these up here. But I had a couple other samples from some other artists. Noel Treyu, who is a really great 
Really great with shape and depth. Great with foreground, midground, and background. Sorry that piece looks so small there. She's over at Sony. Really fantastic. Okay, there's another one of her pieces. That would be a great one. So um, that'd be a great assignment right there. You guys want to go home and work on something? Fortunately, this isn't a class where I have to grade you, and, like punish you, and whip you if you don't do work. That's next semester. But graveyards! Graveyards are freaking awesome. Graveyards are like the best thing in the world you can draw. Why? Tombstones! Tombstones from everywhere. Have you ever seen where Jim Morrison's buried? He's buried in France. France has some of the most badass tombstones I've ever seen in my whole entire life. You ever seen a, a, a Spanish graveyard before? That's what the tombstones look like. They're like heavily engraved. Huge influence of the Catholic Church and engraving. Really cool stuff. What would an Irish graveyard look like? Go do that as an assignment. So this is for Hotel T. What would a graveyard look like in Transylvania? Well, you're the development artist. You guys want to be concept artists or development artists. You're the one that has to go out and do the work. You have to go do the research. You need to find out what the trees look like, what the surrounding bushes look like in that environment. Because I can tell you this, bushes in the south are going to be different from bushes in Central Europe by Transylvania or Hungary or Budapest or Czechoslovakia. Okay. Sparth does these little comps all the time. He used to post some up. Puts a lot of them in his book. They're not more than maybe five or ten minutes for him. It's just these quick comps. Can we tell what type of guy that is? Do we know if he's NATO or do we know if he's a freedom fighter or is a U.S. military? We don't know. It doesn't matter. All you got to do is put a helmet, a freaking antenna, or a rifle in his hand. Seriously, it's like three little steps, right? Do we know what kind of plane that is? No. We don't know if that's a, a troop plane. We don't know if that's a flying saucer. We don't know if he's going there to camp. Maybe he's looking for fellow friends. We don't know any of that. We just There's enough there left to the imagination that's blocked out that we can sort of figure stuff out. Okay? Um, I, you know, I accidentally uploaded some of these other images. I have a bunch of other images. I can go up and correct that really quick from Spark. You guys can look at. So um, what I would recommend for a lot of you is those of you that are wanting to branch out and try something different, and that's the benefit of a workshop as we get into tone, is pick a subject matter here. Castle on a hill on giant in giant mountains and draw it and see where you get. What's another subject matter? Graveyard. What's another subject matter? Two characters overlooking a city. Close up of old ruins. Okay? You have all these different options that you guys can do. You can tap. Now, you might, Christine, you might say, well, I, I can't draw like Spark. I don't know what he's thinking. Go trace his stuff. That's the best thing to do. Do you know what every one of the American illustrators were told to do? They went and they were told to go copy Master's works. Okay? Hold on a minute. You guys know who this is? Jamie Jones? Super amazing. Really, really talented guy. Okay? Amazing painter, great sense of color, light, very rough, gestural. It's one of my favorite pieces. I love that, that guy. Look at that ship right there, that totally different looking mech that you've ever seen before. It's like part crab meets, you know, large gun. Okay. Look at that helmet. Guy's got like three eyes on each side. Totally awesome. Okay. Guess where Jamie learned to paint from? He didn't go to art school. He went to a junior college. And he didn't go to art center. He didn't go to Northridge or some advanced school, uh, Ringling School of Design or Rhode Island School of Design. He went to a junior college. And I heard this on an interview. He wasn't happy with some of the instructors that he had. And one day he went over in the classroom and there was a, a book there on Dean Cornwell. Okay.
Dean Cornwell is a American illustrator. And he started looking at his paintings and he was blown away at the subject matter, composition, the brush strokes, where the lights and darks were. And if the story's right, what I remember what he did is he took that, asked to borrow that book on Dean Cornwell, and he took it and he painted every single painting that was inside that book. He copied it down to brush stroke, down to composition, everything. Okay? And so when people ask, dude, where'd you go to school? Dude, Jamie Jones. And just that name sounds cool too. Jamie Jones. It's like a pirate. Watch out for Jamie Jones, right? No. But I mean, this this guy's just everything that he does is just the composition's impressive. Um let me go back there. Let me find the link to his site. Right there. Gallery. It's beautiful. And he's well respected in his industry too. Because every now and then you get people like this, like a Paul Felix. Paul Felix, you guys know who he is. He's one of the head designers as a Disney feature. Um, I knew his brother really well, and I actually took classes with Paul back in the day. Paul, super nice guy. Um, Paul went to Harvard. He was studying economics and business and graduated. He came back out to California, and his two brothers happened to be in animation. I think there was a family accident. Something happened to one of them. And then he had a brother named Phil, and I met Phil back in the day because we were both teaching on the side at this place in Burbank called Animation Academy. And um, Phil, was, Phil Felix was super awesome. And uh, Paul Felix became like the first guy at Disney who started, he basically revolutionized everything from 1998 on. Because he was the first artist that came out that had a layout background. And he came in there and he started drawing characters inside his stories, indicating story plot, scene, and action. And he revolutionized everything. He had some of the most advanced composition nobody had ever really seen before. Paul Felix is one of those guys like Jamie Jones that, you know, can you imagine where he didn't even go to an art school and he just picked up a freaking Dean Carnival book and studied it? But he, and there's other artists he looked at too. I mean, if you're really smart and you look at Dean Cornwell, you better go look at N.C. Wyatt and Howard Pyle. Those are two other American illustrators that already figured all this stuff out. They went to the Brandywine School. You know what you had to do at the Brandywine School? You had to learn how to master tone first. First you had to learn how to draw. You took figure drawing. You had to master tone and how to paint and tone and light. Then you got to move into color. You never made the jump the other way around. Okay? Look at that. That's one of my favorite ones. Like, look at how cool that shit is. Look how hard it is to paint smooth surface. Look at the light reflecting in there. See the warm against the cools? Dude. Look at all the detail down here. Oh, that's a bitch in shape. And then he's super rough, loose. Look at that. It's awesome stuff. So hopefully that inspires you guys a little bit. Shape, color, all that good stuff coming together. Okay. All right, so let me wrap up. Let me let me stop this really quick. So what does that mean? I might post this up for some of you guys that, um, that weren't here today. So what does this mean that I want you to do? I, we talked about gritting, yes, last week. We talked a little bit about perspective. I, I want to take a look at what the work that you guys have, but I want to make sure that you're applying this in your work. I want to make sure you're thinking about some of my students, not to pick on anybody, Quinn, uh, <laughs> And some other people, you guys are doing this thing sometimes where you're you're just giving me foreground, midground, background really quick, and there's no depth. Or you're giving me like all midground, one foreground, and then there's nothing in the back. I need you to go in and start thinking like this. You have to be able to think like this. There's no reason why you can't have a horizon line high and be looking at things coming down and make caverns and make dropped cliffs. Okay. When we go upstairs, I'll turn on 
um, I'll sketch for this like this. This is how I sketch all the time at home. I just take a frame, I put a bunch of lines in there, and I start seeing angles, and I come up with a cool looking composition, and that's a quick thumbnail that I do. Okay, so I'll go up and start to sketch like this. I want you to do this and get this down because this is really mastering your thumbnailing right here. And if you can master this mode of thought, when you get to working in tone, which we're about to jump into, when you get to tone and light, you have the ability to turn on this own little x-ray in your head. And this is what I want you to do. I want you to be able to be working in something that's like this. And I want you to be able to turn on your secret power and do that and think of it as a grid. Do you know why that's so important? When we get to light, light's casting from the left, right? Is the light going to hit this surface first or is it going to hit that surface first? You have to determine that. And the only way to really understand that is to understand grid planes, which are facades. Understanding what point does the light hit first. And sometimes you're going to have to make that decision on your own. If this is turning away from me and dipping down, how do I create that depth in there? How do I get that grid to feel like it's long and narrow? not just something that's really simple, okay? It takes a lot of practice and time to be able to get to this level. And I think it's, I think every one of you in this class can totally, in my classes or in this workshop, can uh, get to this level and, and obtain this, okay? Anyway, let me stop right there and then we'll head upstairs. So next week's lecture, not next week, we're not gonna be next week, but the week after, I'm going to, see you later. Um, I'm gonna talk about silhouette shape and then we're going to start to look at compositions where we're using shapes inside there okay all right stop